If these walls could talk, my, the stories they could tell. And the lessons they could teach. They're part of the very fabric of this family. What was it like growing up in Colfort? Oh, it was wonderful. <laughs> well, maybe it wasn't that way in the beginning. Oh, no. In fact, in 1867, Cove Creek was a pretty forbidding place. Desert, really. But not much water, too many snakes, and only an occasional traveler. But the place was becoming a crossroads as settlements were pushing further south, and Cove Creek was a convenient camping spot along the trail. In April of 1867, President Brigham Young sent Father a letter asking him to build a fort at Cove Creek. Dear Brother Hinckley, we wish to get a good and suitable person to settle and take charge, a man of sound, practical judgment and experience. Your name has been suggested. The object of building a fort is to afford protection to the telegraph and mail stations and to travelers who are almost constantly on the road. Oh, I shall never forget the arrival of that message. The messenger rode up to the house and passed Father the letter, and he read it carefully. Father was a man of action, not a letter writer. His answer was simple. Say to the president, I will be there on the appointed day. And so our lives changed in an hour. Our thoughts of a permanent home in Colville were given up forever. And questions about a fort out on the highway between settlements occupied our attention. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, who unto the Savior for refuge have fled? Father had no architect, no surveyor, no engineer to help him, but he was not without experience, and he had great faith. He had lived in Nauvoo and heard the prophet Joseph Smith preach. When the saints left Nauvoo, he left too. At the Sweetwater, his wife and brother both died on the same day. He buried them there and came on to the Salt Lake Valley. But during the next few years, he made two trips back across the plains to help others. Yes, Father was no stranger to sacrifice, but he must have felt especially lonely that cold spring morning in 1867. He left his family hundreds of miles away in Colville. He was alone. But he wasted no time in sympathizing with himself. He had been called to build a fort, and he began. From April to November, the ground was measured and staked, lava rock delivered, timbers gathered, and all necessary craftsmen employed. the day we moved to Coldport. It was November 1867. It took 10 days to make the trip, and we were relieved to finally get there. Father had told us about the fort, and we were glad to see that it was just as he described it. The fort is built of volcanic rock laid up in lime mortar. The walls are 18 feet high. On the east side is a gateway 14 feet square with a substantial arch. There are 12 rooms, 
six on the north and six on the south, one chimney to each room. Lumber, mostly cedar and pine, was used for the roof and the doors at the east and west ends. There was also a barn and a blacksmith shop and other interesting places for children to explore. The next spring, we plowed the fields and planted crops. Father had a great and sympathetic heart. He'd been an orphan boy himself that made him very tender toward the children. In those early days, it was not isolation to be at the port. The news of the West throbbed over the lines into the telegraph office. It was magic watching the dots and dashes turn into words. The stagecoach came twice a day loaded with passengers. Look, there it is. Wow! We would get on the fort wall with a field glass and see when it was coming. See now? There were always interesting visitors, a constant parade of them. The fort at Cove Creek is a very credible place, being one of the finest structures of its kind in the territory. We were warmly welcomed and excellently cared for by Brother Hinckley and his family. The fort was also a busy way station. Settlers moving on to new communities unhitched their teams and led the horses to the barn. There were visits from church leaders and territorial officials, oh, all sorts of people. Conversation was always lively and interesting around the dinner table, where each night a new variety of visitors joined the family for dinner. Some of them recorded interesting accounts about their visit. Our supper was excellent. I marveled at the presence of such dainties in that inhospitable-looking spot. Later, the ticking of the telegraph insisted on being heard as we all knelt down for prayers. Travel of our visitors and for their kind generosity. The six rooms along the south side of the fort were used for business, domestic, and social activities. The kitchen and dining room were usually the heart of things. The rooms on the north served as private bedrooms for the family and overnight lodging for our guests. Our room was nicely furnished and looked very cozy as we drew our chairs around the center table, which had a number of well-chosen books upon it. Winters could be long and cold, sometimes exceedingly severe. We were always thankful when spring arrived. Cove Fort was a very interesting place for boys. Wild horses ranged the hills east of it, and in a boy's mind, the cowboys that herded them were experts. There never was a battle pitched at the fort. In fact, I was the only person ever shot here. My brother Ed and I found a pistol once when father and mother were away. He accidentally pulled the trigger and shot me in the knee. Father walked the floor with me all night to soothe the pain. We learned to work hard, too. Even as a girl, I can remember father saying that I did the work of a grown woman. From age 11, I took care of all the milk we got from our 30 cows. Father and mother taught us all to work, usually right alongside of them. Mother grew herbs and vegetables in the gardens. We helped her gather wild currants and gooseberries and rhubarb and pick apples from the orchard that grew on the east side of the road. Domestic life wasn't easy. Mother cooked and cared for the family. She prepared thousands of meals for the hungry travelers who stopped here. She cleaned and scrubbed in seasons of sickness and health. Okay. Adele, help me pull up these. She brought beauty to this place. Pull it tight. 
Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. They also taught us to have faith in the Savior, to live his teachings and follow his example. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. The years of happy life within those walls made it not only a safe place, but more a sacred home. For more than 20 years, Cove Fort served an important function, but eventually times changed. A fort was no longer necessary. In 1890, the structure was leased out and finally sold, and the family moved to Fillmore. It was the end of an era. always remember those days at Cove Fort. We learned some lessons there that have made us stronger, better people. Faith and courage, sacrifice and service, things we won't forget. Cove Fort is part of who we are, and we are part of it. This place was constructed to provide safety and rest, nourishment and comfort. It was operated by good Samaritans who gave succor to those in need. Hunger was satisfied here, wounds were dressed, comfort and hope were spoken, and there was prayer. Gratitude was expressed for the gift of life. Pleadings were offered to God, our eternal Father, for strength to do the work of the day, for faith to go forward in the face of adversity, for blessings of rain and sunshine. Those who built and lived here believed in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. They believed in family. They believed in the nation whose flag flew over this fort. They believed in the church which they loved and honored and served. They were men and women of refinement who cultivated in this desert area the better elements of life. They read together the sacred books they loved. In solemnity, they gathered their families about them and spoke with their eternal Father in the name of His beloved Son, the Redeemer of the world. More solid than the foundation upon which these rock walls stand, was their quiet faith. 